What's up, everybody? On today's episode, we enter dun, 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 the panic room. Should you be freaking out on these players? James Conner, Juju Smith-Schuster, your level of concern moving forward for the rest of the season, as well as breaking down this nice Thursday night matchup we have coming. Don't miss a moment of today's show. Hey, Foot Clan, before we start today's show, we just wanted to invite you to be a part of the greatest fantasy football community the best. ever. Mike says the best. That's, the best! It's like the greatest. Jointhefoot.com, our listener community, over 11,000 strong. You get an extra episode every week. You get access to premium stats, premium flex rankings. We've got our consistency charts. You get community access on the forums and a whole lot more. So check all that out at jointhefoot.com. This is Melvin Gordon from the Los Angeles Chargers, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh! Welcome in. Welcome into the show Wednesday, September 25th. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast back with you. You know, they say that sometimes there's, you know, panic in the streets. And today we've got like a panic room episode and we've got buy or sell. But there seems to be optimism in the streets as the show begins because of Melvin Gordon news. There is. But I can't. We can't move on before you you comparing the phrase "panic in the streets" to a panic room. I think we have two very different situations going on here. What is panic in the streets? That's when there is a mob running crazy. Well, okay. And then the panic room is where I go. You don't think there's a bunch of James Conner owners out in the streets right now running to and fro? So perhaps what should have been panic in the streets? Because the panic room is more like a safe place. I think people deal with their issues differently some people lock up and go to the panic room yeah. and say some, i'm i don't want to deal with this some people go nuts they're just rioting through they're, the streets you know stealing tvs out of the windows james carter made me do this <laughs> <laughs> some people deal with their panic through just bold just face theft full theft just ri riot in the streets some people break the law to deal with their stress uh well <laughs> well welcome in we also have the Thursday night preview on today's episode of the show. I encourage you to check us out on Instagram, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. We're on YouTube. Uh, we're on Twitter. We appreciate all the subscriptions, reviews on Apple Podcasts. We're ad free on Stitcher Premium. And uh, the community, as I said at the top of the show, join the foot.com and come be a part of this independent podcast. Supporting the show, getting a bunch of perks. It's really fun. All right. Before we talk about Melvin Gordon, it is Wednesday, the Wednesday episode of the show, which means buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. All right, we have a week four NFC South edition of buy or sell. Devonta Ooh. Freeman takes on Tennessee this week. Buy or sell 10 plus fantasy points. Last week he had 11. That's so we we did it, Devonta. Eh, sort of. I mean, look, the usage was way up. However, Ido Smith suffered a concussion in that game, and we saw Devonta Freeman's snaps rise to over ninety percent when the previous week he had played on just sixty-two percent. So is and, that a good or bad thing that he produced uh, eleven fantasy points on ninety-two percent of snaps? That is a bad thing. I mean, you would assume that if Devonta Freeman, he was he he was efficient. Right, he was over like five and a half a he was, carry. He was sixteen for eighty-eight. He had four targets again and three receptions. However, on those three receptions, he only managed seven receiving yards. It, now that was a good defense against the. I think the Colts are a pretty good defense, but this week Tennessee is also a very good defense. When Ito Smith got knocked out, it wasn't midway through. Ito Smith played less than five percent of the snaps. So this became the Devonta Freeman show. I think if Edo Smith isn't out of the concussion protocol, you're going to have another backup step up into the role. And so I would say I'm taking the under on Devonta Freeman. I'll but take I'll take the over because it's a low line. I mean, I, I'll take the 11 points. I think he can put that up. Atlanta, you know, we just we just looked at a, a chart that Kyle, 
our editor in chief produced this morning. I don't know if you two gentlemen I looked did at not it see yet. It. Amazing. It's uh, the difference between 2018 and 2019 percentage of pass plays on an offense, and also shows the difference. For example, Minnesota minus 25 percent. That's yeah. the difference. Last year they passed 64 percent of the time through three games. They're passing 38 percent of the time. That is insane. However, Atlanta is actually up 5% through three games. 65% of the time last year, which is already a lot. They're at 70% this year throwing the ball. So you've said this before. Devonta Freeman needs to be involved in the passing game to have the right kind of value. He's not being used enough, and they're not running the ball very much. It's I mean, Four targets a game is it's nothing to sneeze at. We, we were hoping for more for Freeman. But it, the offense is still high powered. Matt Ryan is averaging basically three passing touchdowns a game. The line at eleven points. It's it, it's Freeman get a rushing touchdown finally, and it's, it's certainly possible that the, the matchup is not great. But I will buy. I will buy that line because it's just that's forty yards and a touchdown. Buy or sell Calvin Ridley with the down week. Buy. I buy that he had a down week. Uh, back to six plus targets do you think he gets back to six plus targets only one target last week jason enjoyed the monday punday contribution of ridley squat ridley squat uh i i do think he gets back i will to buy uh, he he will be on the course of the season the clear number two wide receiver here i think six targets is a reasonable outcome for him and uh, yeah i think he gets back on the horse i'm gonna sell it really? i'm gonna sell it yeah yeah mike you bought it I did. Greg Olson against Houston, six catches and 60 yards. Are you buying or selling six and 60? If you look at the target numbers through three games at the tight end position, Greg Olson outpacing George Kittle. So six Greg catches, is, six, 60 yards. He is old man strengthened all over the place. He's been pretty solid at least the past two weeks. So, But the line is six for 60, which he has hit the past two weeks. I'm going to buy it. Man. He'll keep it going. I think he's a wonderful, you know, option for Kyle Allen in the passing game. I am going to sell. I think that uh, while Kyle Allen did great, it was against Arizona, who is notoriously bad against tight ends so far on the season. Every single week, the tight end has crushed them. And now they're going up against Houston, who's only given up 4.8 fantasy points per game in the first three weeks to the tight end position. So I will, I will say not this week, Greg. Yeah, it that's a really good line to set there. It, I'm going to sell. I think he'll be very close, but I'm going to sell. Jameis Winston at least two passing touchdowns against the Rams week weeks one and two. He only had one. Obviously, last week he had three. All to uh, the big tall guy, Mike Evans. <laughs> so <laughs> what a great nickname. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I I used to say that all the time about Cardinals quarterbacks. Like if you just throw it to the big long haired guy. Yes. You know, Larry Fitzgerald, you're going to do better with, uh, you know, for yourself. But Winston figured it out, right? Threw the ball up to Mike Evans, and it, it ended up in three passing touchdowns. Do you think he'll get two this week? I'll, I'll buy two. I think he can do two. Why not? <laughs> it's such a <laughs> it's tough. It's just two. <laughs> it's such a tough thing because I don't know what to make of the Rams defense so far this year, but I right. they seem really good. I don't know how much was – Baker and the Browns and their offensive line being just really bad or how much was the Rams defense but I think I'm going to sell even though this seems like okay the Rams are going to score the Buccaneers are going to come back and have to throw a lot they just haven't been beaten through the air so far all right that was buy yourself from pristine auction pristineauction.com use the code ballers and you can get access to a five dollar discount on your first sports memorabilia purchase Today on the wall, we've got Devontae Adams signed jersey up on the wall. I like it, Brooks. I like the, like the confidence push. Well, the shot in the arm worked for Mike Evans last week. Yes, it did. So maybe You're welcome, America. For Devontae Adams this week. Let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. Presented by Sleeper. All right, the morning started with Adam Schefter talking about Melvin Gordon's holdout and that it could soon be coming to an end. No final decisions had been made, but per league sources, he may be returning to the team soon. He had planned on October and might be moving up, and then Ian Rappaport tweeted out uh, that 
he basically retweeted another tweet saying that it could end as soon as Thursday. So this why could be not a, today? This just keeps escalating rapidly because we all want control in our lives, Mike, and so we set arbitrary dates so that we control things. That's yes. what, that's what Melvin's doing. Melvin's now, control has worked the good perfectly. News, the good news, according to his Instagram, is that he has been working out on a treadmill with his helmet on, so he should be ready to go. Right? Hey, to to his credit. Now that we have this kind of like a real helmet here on our set, we all put it on. I've never taken a snap in my life. Holy crap, a helmet is super heavy. My weak, frail neck could could barely well, this, keep it up. This is why we've always said we want them to run the 40 with a helmet on. Yes. And pads, but, you know, like, like they do in football. It makes so much sense. And I would love to see the disparity. Have everybody run the 40 just like you normally do. Oh, that's good. Then have good. everybody run it in pads and see if the same people are on top. If they are all in the exact same order, you don't need to do this any more years. Yeah, that, just that, a one-year you know? trial. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Like Dalvin Cook, you would be like oh my gosh. slow without pads, fast with pads by yeah. comparison to the people around him. Yeah. So I do want to break down what this looks like for Austin Eckler if Melvin Gordon comes back because maybe it's not, you know, even if it's this week, you know, Rappaport said he's not expected to play even if he showed up tomorrow. Right, yes. So the earliest he'd play would be like October 6th against the Broncos. So Eckler should be the guy that you want to start this week. And we've said Justin Jackson could be a start as well or at least a flex play. But when Gordon comes back, you know, this news is out there now. You don't get to go cash in on Eckler anymore. And so what are the options for fantasy owners? I looked at Eckler last year. He finished the year at 27 at the position, so outside of the RB2 range. He had one finish last year inside the top 10. It was week one. I'll say the, the week one, he went ham. Uh, yeah. He, yeah, he, yeah, he was ninth that week. And then he had six other finishes last season as an RB1 or RB2, and they were fringe RB1s. They were like 10, 10, and then other RB2 finishes. So for me, when I look at what this looks like with Gordon coming back, I think Oc – uh, Austin Eckler's value is probably RB two until Gordon reestablishes over a couple of weeks, and then he's you know he's an RB three for me with RB two upside. What do you guys think? I completely agree with that assessment. He is he's a weekly type of a flex play. Once it, we're, we're assuming that Melvin Gordon is handed that job pretty quickly, but with his skill set and the way that they use running backs on there, he can hit a big play. On a on a weekly near weekly basis, so he becomes a flex play, and you're you are correct, Andy. Like, uh, let's say you have Austin Eckler right now, because this is all still we're in the land of rumors and whispers from the bushes. We don't know for sure that Melvin Gordon is coming back as soon as tomorrow. Maybe he doesn't even come back next week. I remember playing this game last year with Le'Veon Bell, where these very uh, respected, verified sources of Schefter and Rappaport they were tweeting how. Okay, this we we've, we've got inside sources. Le'Veon Bell's coming back this week. Oh, he didn't come back. Okay, my source now says it will not be later than this date. And of course, Le'Veon Bell didn't show up. So, are, if you have Eckler right now, are you trying to scrape whatever little value is out there, or are you just holding on for the ride? You, I don't think you could trade Eckler for much right now. I think you have to hold on for the ride. If you wanted to try to go out. <laughs> As an Eckler owner and trade for Melvin Gordon, you, you could try, but probably with this news, you're not going to be able to get him for uh, you know anything but top dollar. Let, let me and, ask. And the, the, other, the other side is to reverse that and go out, go to the Melvin Gordon owner and say, hey, will you pay me top do dollar for Eckler because then you have him and then he's your handcuff. But, again, I'm not, I'm not actively, actively shopping him because I think I'm going to get a week or two of top-tier value out of him. And there is a narrative here that I can – I can find where Eckler has a little bit better value than he did last year. You know, you do not have Antonio Gates or Hunter Henry. You have a banged up Travis Benjamin. You have a low target volume Mike Williams right now and a high target volume uh, Keenan Allen. So there, there may be a little bit more room for consistency in the passing game for Austin Eckler. And he's been the guy in camp and not been the guy holding out and been committed to the team. So there could be a little bit more lasting staying power to Eckler than we even believe. So hypothetically, though, if someone else has Austin Eckler and they were offered a trade of Miles Sanders and then <laughs> either Will Fuller or John Ross, should, this that, is just hypothetical. should that person accept that trade? Absolutely not. Jo so you could have John Ross and Miles Sanders right. 
for Austin Eckler? No. I think it's interesting. Wow. I do not. No, I think Austin Eckler's season-long value is greater sign Miles Sanders right now. And, you know, you're you're going to be trading two for two. got to drop somebody to do that trade if you're the Eckler owner. I'm, a, I'm on the no side. Jason, you're on the interesting side? I'm on the somewhat. I mean, it's not like – Austin Eckler, well, while can, he while he could be a flex play when Melvin Gordon comes back, it's not like he's just an automatic every week he's going to be fine. He had a lot of complete duds last year when he you know had fourteen. He only had he only had three duds. He only had three duds all season long. I looked that up this morning. He was injured a little bit, but he only had three games where he finished outside really that RB two RB three range. Yeah, I think we've looked up maybe a little something he obviously missed a couple games week three he was rb 41 later 44 59 44 so you're right it wasn't a ton of those um you know four and then it's just a matter of do you think being the rb 35 or the rb 28 on a week is is you know getting it done you know and it's not to say he can't pop something off you don't have a hard time deciding whether to start Miles Sanders right now or John Ross? Oh, certainly. Well, yeah, I mean, I think John Ross could be the real deal. But do you think Miles Sanders' value goes up as the season goes along or goes down? It's hard to say right now. Sure, definitely. But what I'm just saying, your, your opinion as an analyst, do you believe that Miles Sanders gets more involved as the season goes on or it's, not? It's my hope that he gets more involved. Because that, that's my only question is, as the season goes along, does Eckler's value drop and Sanders goes up? Maybe. But what we do know is this week. I, I don't want to Austin start Miles Eckler's Sanders or John Ross right now. I want to start Austin Eckler for the next few weeks. That's where, I, that's where I'm at. Uh, let's move on. Vance McDonald's shoulder sprain. They say that he won't have an extended absence, and then they set it by trading <laughs> a fifth round pick for Nick Vanette. It was a five. Yeah. Okay. You know the Seahawks. I thought I had seen a three being out there. I was like, that's insane. But so a five. Yeah, the Seahawks right. traded Vanette away, brought back Luke Wilson. <laughs> and oh, nice! And this was uh, this is a shot in the arm for Will Disley more than anything yes, else. Yes, I mean, I, I totally agree. Nick Vanette, he had his opportunity last year to establish himself as as a pass catching weapon. It did not work out, and now it certainly seems like Vance McDonald will miss at least a few weeks. What a good trade for the Seahawks! You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they traded Nick Vanette for Luke Wilson in a fifth. Like if you if you look at grabbing, the fantasy the fantasy yes. attitude towards it, the trade exactly Get, getting Luke Wilson back is like what's the difference between for the Seahawks Luke Wilson and Nick Vanette is there any well we'll see I mean Wilson was cut this off season so maybe he's lost something but he knows the system teams are comfortable with him you know bringing him in a reminder with waivers going through today check the drop it like it's hot drop it like it's hot make sure you see who people are dropping to pick up all these free agents including guys like Wayne Gallman. And, uh, you know, you do need to make plans to be without Vance McDonough for a little while. I'm not At least a week. At least a week. So other free agent tight ends. There was a name, you know, that, that we didn't bring up to keep, like, an eye on. You know, we bring up Herndon mm -hmm. at tight end. Yes, I, I know who you're talking about. Um, talking about hard knocks. Yeah. Is that who you thought I was no, talking no, about? No, no, I thought you were talking about – no, yeah, Dawson Knox is oh. interesting. Dawson Knox had he's, kind of a breakout game, and he ran a ton of routes last week for Buffalo. Jason, you own him in Dynasty League. Yeah, he's getting volume. He, he is getting volume. The, the other stash tight end who we also should have brought up, he's another suspended player. It's Ben Watson. Yeah. he's He will be back sooner than Chris Herndon. One but, week, right? One week sooner? Yes. Uh, yes. So, that, yeah, that's an interesting one. There are some guys out there that are kind of floating around if you need help during bye weeks, which everybody other than George Kittle owner is about to face. News and notes is always brought to you by the Sleeper app. Don't miss a single piece of impactful fantasy news. For instance, when Melvin Gordon walks in to camp with the helmet on, don't you want to know? I would like to know. I don't want to get. I don't want to make a dumb trade before I'm in the know. When, All right, when, so get the app today. Are they like, when when he walks in? I can just imagine the GM in a really high backed chair. Slowly oh, turning hello. around. Well, 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 Mr. Gordon. That's why he has to keep the visor on so you can't see <laughs> look him in the eye. He's never <laughs> taking that helmet I would not off. take the helmet I off. I don't blame you. Hey, get, I, I, I need my money. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank today's sponsor. You may have heard of them. Pepsi. Oh, oh yeah. So delicious. 
Pepsi takes all NFL celebrations to the next level, whether it's a Hail Mary touchdown, a de defensive stop on the goal line, a Super Bowl win. When it's time to celebrate, it's time to crack open a Pepsi. I remember a Pepsi-level celebration in our flag league. Jason Moore scored a touchdown. Oh, yeah. He began flying around like an airplane. I was the airplane. That's Coming right. in for the landing in I, the end zone. I wove in and out of every player. I got some yellow uh, laundry thrown my way yeah, from you did some get, referees. You got an excessive celebration, but that's kind of how I feel with the, uh, the, yes. the Pepsi. And uh, nothing washes that down better than an ice-cold Why don't Pepsi? Did you crack why one open in front have, of the referee? <laughs> yeah. You don't, why don't we have them right now? Like That's I wanna, an excellent question. I mean, I could do this right into the microphone. <laughs> Yes, look. They, they didn't pay for us to drink them on the set. Oh, yeah. I'll drink them right now. <laughs> yeah, they don't need to. Pepsi's freaking delicious. A game day tastes better with Pepsi. You got all those snacks. You got that game day food. Oh. Nothing washes it down better than that blue can, that Pepsi. And remember, Pepsi is the official sponsor of the NFL, and they remind you, always be celebrating Jason Moore style. Yep. Hey, Foot Clan, if you're out there, you're running a business, you know, as I know, hiring can be a slow process, and it's also super important. When I ran my uh, Broken Bowl Game Studios, the, the success and failure of that company was based on hiring, and it's really tough. Here's a good example. Cafe Altura COO, Dylan uh, Miskowitz. He needed to hire a director of coffee for his organic company. He was tr having trouble finding a good qualified applicant. That's why he switched to ZipRecruiter. Look, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. Its technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply for your job. He was so impressed by how quickly he got a great candidate to apply. He is uh, he, he has now his perfect uh, role filled as the director of coffee. Got to got to direct the coffee, man. You got to. Four out of five Action. employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality <laughs> candidate within the first day. Look, see why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at our web address. It's ZipRecruiter.com slash footballers. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash footballers. ZipRecruiter.com slash footballers. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. <laughs> all right. Let's head into the panic room. We're heading into week four. It is a a dangerous time for fantasy teams. I've got a league I'm 0-3 in. I'm fighting for that title. The, the, the ball has bounced the wrong direction. And, uh, you know, it, this is the time. you got to know whether to move forward with players with confidence, whether to – So time to start looting? Yeah, <laughs> as Jason would say. <laughs> and the truth is, is, you know, it doesn't do you any good as a fantasy football owner to dig in on – preseason narratives and believe that they're going to come to fruition if they're not it's also not the time to freak out and panic on players you know Devonte adams could be could be in the panic room let's step inside it's a very very stressful place to be is well, this going on the, the whole segment the, the entire rest of the episode we talk through that sound effect so so we're going to bring up some players we we put it out on twitter the most requested players Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the YouTube community. We're going to bring up some guys. And I'm going to ask you to find, gentlemen, what level of panic you're at. And I've established four levels of panic. Level one is you're not panicked, okay? You can't even hear that sound. Level two, you're somewhat worried, right? Maybe your hand's over the button. Level three, you're getting a little freaked out. Freaking out, man. Yeah, you're getting a little worried. You're scared. What do you do? And then level four, that's a, that's a full-on... <laughs> <laughs> Full on panic, okay? All right. So let's start with, uh, and these are all the most requested players that we've had. We've talked about some a little more than others, but Sony Michelle. Right now, Sony Michelle is the RB35 on the season. And I'm going to give you a few stats on both sides of the equation. Maybe that will panic you, some that might calm you down. Snap count wise, in week one. 33%. Week two, 49%. Week three, 22%. He's only RB35 on the year because he scored, I think, three touchdowns. One avoided tackle on 45 rushing attempts. Last among qualifying running backs in yards after contact. 
And then he does have 10 attempts inside the 10-yard line, which is second most at the running back position. So they give him the ball down there. And the Patriots are running the football 55% of the time. So where are you? What's your level of panic with Sony Michelle? I am at a of our system. Yes. I am number three. I am, You're getting a little freaked out? I am a bit freaked out. He actually, he has uh, two rushing touchdowns, Andy, and that means that of his 20.8 points and a half point PPR scoring format, 12 of them are because of touchdowns. That is pretty lopsided. You need to see more. The Him not being elusive. Week two, he committed the largest sin that Bill Belichick knows about, and that's he fumbled the ball. We know how Uncle Bill responds when his running backs fumble the ball. And here, a stat that I heard on the way in, I was listening to a good friend of the show, J.J. Zacharyson's podcast. How many snaps have the New England Patriots run while trailing? Probably zero. Zero. Yeah. They have not been trailing for a single snap through three weeks, and Sony Michelle is not getting the ball uh, like you would think for that type of a game script. So I, I'm actually a three as well, a little freaked out. I actually think what we're seeing in New England is a little bit like what we saw with Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman last year, where, yes, Sony Michelle has been inefficient, but right now the game planning when he's in there for snaps is really obvious. You're going to run the ball. Right. When he's in unlimited snaps, you're going to run it up the middle. So he's not being put in a position to do a lot the way Royce Freeman was, and he's not offering them flexibility to use him like Burkhead. When Burkhead's in, you don't know what they're doing. They might be throwing the ball. They might be running the ball. He's had the opportunity to be a little, he's been a more explosive. My excuse for Sony Michelle or my patience comes from what he did in the in the playoffs. That uh, was a long time ago now. Fantasy wise. Sure, but it was it was four, it was it was four, four games ago. I mean it was uh, but it fantasy was, wise, that's a long time ago. It, not not to me. No. Okay. And and so and you've had also uh, three blowouts and this is a first round draft pick. So those are the reasons why I don't think – I think it's wrong to overreact to Sony Michel and the snap counts because they're going to need him more in competitive ball games than I think you believe they will. Yeah, I am a two, so I am less concerned than you two gentlemen. I believe that the fact that they have not needed him at all – I know you, you hope that he's the guy that's running the clock out, but when you're up by the level that the Patriots have been up in these games – and you've got a first round pick who's important to your team with a knee issue that you know why why stress him out when you don't need him i'm not worried about his yards per carry about how ineffective and inefficient he's been so far this year because he's a good back he looked great in preseason he's looked good last year he looked he, he didn't just all of a sudden forget how to play football the 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 one thing that scares me the most which is in the early off season why i was calling him a bust and I'm and neither of you brought it up as threes on your panic scale. He he is not a part of the passing game at all. He doesn't have a target on the season. That panics me more than his lack of effectiveness as a running back so far. Bottom five yards per carry on this season of qualified running backs, so there's seventy five included. Bottom five. Joe Mixon two point eight, Adrian Peterson two point eight, carry on Johnson two point six, Sonny Michelle two point four, and Damian Williams one point five on twenty two carries. So uh, the, it's not the only stat that matters. And especially in New England, it really is not the only stat that matters because most of the narrative around Sonny Michelle was this is a guy that could score 18 times sure. because of the offense. So we'll see what happens. Mike, you're at a three. I'm at a three. I'm not liking what I'm seeing snap count wise. And Jason's at a two. We good to move on? Yep. Yes, sir. Let's move on to Juju Smith-Schuster. Juju Wide receiver, 25 on the season. That is not what fantasy owners wanted or expected. Nope. Pittsburgh ranks 31st in the league in time of possession. That's five minutes less per game than 2018. This is a product of, you know, when they had Big Ben, the offense wasn't quite in sync, and then now they don't have Big Ben. Uh, he's, he's got a 21% target share, which is 31st among wide receivers. 
on a passing attack that is 16th in pass attempts. Last year, they led the NFL in pass attempts. And so, obviously, you have the very strong variable uh, now of Mason Rudolph through the remainder of the year. He is fourth uh, highest in yards after the catch. 76-yard you know, touchdown right. has a little bit to do with that. So where are you guys panic-wise with Juju? I am a two on Juju as well. A two I'm, Juju? I'm a yeah, two that's, Juju. That's pretty bad. I am, yeah, that's pretty bad. I am a little worried <laughs> because of the change of quarterback. You have to be. You can't just say, well, he's so talented that – uh, it doesn't matter who's throwing on the ball. No, I mean, we've seen them with Hall of Fame wide receivers. If they if they don't have a good quarterback, they're not going to be great. That being said, so far now, half of the season was with Big Ben and half has been with Mason Rudolph, and he's been okay. Yes, it took a breakaway touchdown, but he also had a breakaway touchdown. That's good. He He's on pace for 1,300 yards, and I don't expect Mason Rudolph, as the season goes on, to get worse. I think he gets more comfortable. The team understands him better. They work things out. I think they're a good organization. I think Juju's very talented. He still had, you know, at least seven targets in every game. But I'm worried because his upside is is gone. Yeah, you, you know, it's got to be a downgrade on the end of season expectation. Hundred percent. I mean, I my bold prediction uh, at the Phoenix Live show when we were being spicy was that Juju would be the number one, and that was a, a large chunk of that was on the basis that look, Big Ben has supported a number one many a time, Mason Rudolph is not doing that. Yeah, and I think it would be the same way we would talk about even a player that's been, you know, as consistent as Michael Thomas over a long period of time. Michael Thomas, the ceiling gets downgraded. And it's because you can't hand the ball to a quarterback and expect them to bring you back with his arm. I mean, if they are down in a game, they're still going to have to balance run pass to take the pressure off of Mason Rudolph. He's not going to be able to string together, you know, a drive with six, seven receptions on it. It's just not in the cards right now for Mason Rudolph because you cannot put that level of dependency on him. So I'm a three. I'm a, I'm on the getting freaked out because I probably drafted Juju Smith-Schuster, if, if I did, to be, which I didn't to begin with, just out of luck because I wasn't as high on him and he just went so high. Right. Not because I didn't think he was going to be a good receiver, just because I didn't think he was going to be a great receiver. So I'm not having to deal with it, but... He doesn't represent something to your fantasy team that he did before. Yeah, expectations must be altered. I'm at a two. I think he can still be a a solid wide receiver too. That's uh, what he feels like. That's what it was. Mason Rudolph's first game, he looked real bad. It, he was able to get a little bit together towards the end through the two touchdowns, one to Juju and one to to uh, Deontay. But like that was against the the 49ers, and yes, we're still early on in the season. But as of right now, the 49ers look like the, that team that out of seemingly out of nowhere completely f turned things around. So let I'm going to wait. Let's see let's see how Rudolph does in his second start. Much yeah. easier matchup. Yeah. So we just uh we just saw Wayne Gallman go for 77 out of 100 fab in our wow. league of record. And you said Andy, how much did you bid? I bid sixty five dollars because wow. I need. Wow, man! I would never have bid that if I wasn't. I needed to win this week. That's all it is. I like, got you. I it was a you know I have really tough matchups for like David Mopportunity, I think plays Minnesota this week, and I'm like, well, would I rather play Gallman? You know, with the passing game work with the yeah. consistency, and so I'm literally. I, I was like, hey, if I can buy a couple wins, it's worth the price. I was the second highest bid. The rest were in the thirties, forties. Borrows, uh, Mike, you spent thirty two. But he ended up going for seventy seven. Incredible! When you made your sixty plus dollar bid, you had to believe. Yeah, I thought that he I'd was get. Yours. I, I figured I'd get laughed at. Yeah, yeah. You didn't even get him. Who's nope. laughing now? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I am. <And> whoever <laughs> bid seventy. But that really, it, that's how subjective some of the fab spending is. You know, if I was a three and team in that league, I wouldn't have bid on him at all. Right. I. Yep. It, it's just a matter of do I want to get back in on the season with, with a buy and my wins now matter more than the wins later. I totally 100% get that. I mean, I didn't bid for Gallman in a lot of leagues, but in the, in the listener league where I needed a start, I bid pretty high on him. So that it, that's one of the things that, you know, when we talk waivers, it's yeah, all listener league. Dependent. I think I did like 30 something. I'm I assuming not, I did not get him then. Well, I know I did not cause I did not bid 30 something. All right. James Connor. He's RB30 on the season. We need to know the panic level for James Conner. 
59th in pro football focuses elusive rating. That's behind Jordan Howard and just squeezing by Caleb Blush. But it's Blush. ahead. It's still ahead of Caleb Blush. It is still ahead All of right. Caleb Blush, which right. everybody know, is, right? I think it's an instant retirement if you fall below. It's like that's like the uh the Mendoza line. Right. Is that is that the reference? I hate having to hate Kalen Balash. <laughs> <laughs> He's an ex Arizona State University guy. And uh, you know, much like Josh Rosen, not in a great position to succeed on this team. Sure. But has looked atrocious. So snap counts for James Conner, forty six percent, fifty four percent. Week three was sixty eight percent. Last year, he's an 81% snap count guy. So he's actually not been out there. Big Ben or Mason Rudolph, regardless. Right. He's not been out there as much as he was in the previous week, uh, previous season. We just heard about the offense and its struggles. He's seeing 79% of the rush attempts. Which is great. Which is great. I'm actually at a two on James Conner. I'm on the worried side. I wasn't I wasn't really high on him to begin the season. Sure. So for me, it's not a change of expectation in terms of I think before the season he's an RB2. Right now I think he's still an RB2. So yeah. I'm not that worried. I'm at a 2 and going through the snap counts, you oh that seems like a dire situation. But 79% of the running back rush attempts, 81% of the running back targets. Like if there's work going to a running back, James Conner is still getting it and that includes James Conner went out of a game with, uh, for part of it with a knee injury. So I'm, I'm at a two. It's the same thing as Juju. The star Hall of Fame quarterback went down. You got to adjust your, your expectations. Mike actually got Wayne Gallman in the listener league. Oh, oh did I? He what spent did you $42. Well, there oh, you go. All right. I was like so. 21 or something. Yeah, 40 like is about the real – I think that's the real range. 40 to 45, totally cool with it. There were some rumors this morning about Jay Ajayi – Availability. Did I, did I get JJ? I bid on him there. Did you really? Oh yeah. I was just, just okay, I figure Ew. hey, if I can get him for two bucks and he becomes a starter. If I can get JJ into a nice giant's timeshare, ooh, baby. It will be <laughs> it will be pretty wild to me if Ajayi comes in and actually well, gets he's not, work. He's like not ready to play football yet. That's, right. That's the funny part about it, is he's not sitting there going twiddling his thumbs like I'm ready to rumble. He's like working back into being able to play. They said he could be ready this week. For a time to in New York? We'll see. I, I assume you got him. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Devon, uh, um, so, Jason, where are you at with James Conner? Uh, I'm a three with James Conner um, because he hasn't looked the same. Uh, the offense obviously hasn't looked the same. And the biggest reason is because the game scripts aren't going to be what we hoped they were. You know, you, you wanted him to be on this great Steelers offense that's – in a winning position and running the clock out and being utilized. Okay, so he gets 79% of the running back rush attempts. That's fantastic. But if the team rushing attempts are 75% of what you thought they were going to be because they're down, I'm more scared. So I am I am decently concerned on Carter. Yeah, I think it, I think the floor for Connor on a week-to-week -week basis has yeah, changed. It's, it's much it's lower really, now. It's really bad now as opposed to... He was always safe with good upside. Yeah, yep. Now he's... A risky play with good upside. Yeah, that whole team. That whole team is in trouble. Devontae Adams. Let's talk about Devontae Adams. The wide receiver, 48 on the season through three weeks. That's Gross. Yeah, you know, that's almost a quarter of the fantasy season. So yeah, I think there's reason. There's a reason he's in the panic room, okay? And some stats for him. Uh, only two red zone targets, all right? Two red zone targets on the year. That's the same as Hunter Renfro. <laughs> What a great stat. <laughs> I know. I love that. But but a lot of what Devontae Adams, you guys said it on the show yesterday, what has made, you know, he's made his, his consistency has been built around touchdowns. Yeah. It's not been built around yardage. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, however, through three weeks on Pro Football Focus, he's graded out as the 11th best wide receiver so far. Aaron Rodgers has a great passer rating when targeting him. It's clear that he's his favorite receiver. I'll let you guys go. Um, after I do, because you're, you're you're you share the same rating, I'm a two. I'm a little worried. I, I don't blame you for that. And the worry is, you know, not that he will rebound right to score some touchdowns for Aaron Rodgers. It's the expectation. He was drafted by a lot of people to be number one, number one at the position. The variable there's a variable there. It's Matt Lafleur and the offense. There's a they're three and zero. Oh, 
And they're three and zero with a Devonte Adams at wide receiver forty eight for fantasy. So, do I think he's a wide receiver forty eight? That's outlandish. He's not that. But do I think he's the one? No, I don't. This offense doesn't have the same level of dependency on the passing game that it's had in years past, um, and you can see that in the evidence. They're three and zero, but Green Bay is sitting here with an eleven percent decrease in pass attempts year over year. They were sixty seven percent of the time last year, fifty six percent of the time this year. If you take that out and a little bit of the inconsistency in terms of the target share, I think you have to adjust expectations. So I'm a two. Again, that's sure. not not a not a massive yeah, amount of worry. That's that's totally fine. Now, I might have misheard. So please correct me if I'm wrong. I am still struggling with this lifelong sickness. Um, but I believe Andy said he's gonna let us go first. No. And then immediately I said I'll let you guys go since you have the same uh, I meant like okay. you guys can go I was next. Like, since you have the exact same number. Gotcha. It's really funny to me. I thought he's like, I'm going to let you go. Uh, but listen, <laughs> I'm gonna, this is a full Kanye West. Um, <laughs> I'm going to let you finish. I, but Yeah, but first. So I, I'm not panicked on him. Um, now, you're right, Andy, in, this, in the sense that they're passing the ball less and the ceiling to be the number one, that looks like a very low probability bet. But I'm not worried about Devonta Adams because I I do believe touchdowns are coming. Last week was a horrific matchup for him with Chris Harris Jr. I I you know Aaron Rodgers came out and said I want to get the ball to Devonta Adams more, and he's the one that controls that. I think Devonta Adams is still you know he's a great buy low candidate to me because if the owner believes what you believe, Andy, that like. His, his upside is really capped now if they're not throwing the ball, and you could sell him a little bit cheaper, I think you're going to, even if you're not getting the number one, you're getting a super talented wide receiver who's going to be a consistent, great fantasy producer, and I always want those on my team. Rodgers did say before the season he wants to give Devontae Adams more targets than he had last year, and through three games, executing on the hope hasn't happened, so I don't read a lot into him saying, he definitely needs more now. Sure, but if he said it right before the season and didn't do it through three games. Yeah, I mean, off-season hype is one thing, but literally referring to what just happened and correcting mistakes, I think that's a little bit more actionable than just off-season. You know, responding to a question. Um, Four targets is silly and won't right. happen a lot. Right. Mike, I'm at I'm at a one. I don't blame people if they're they are a bit panicked. I still think that Devontae Adams will finish the season as a top five guy. I think it starts this week against the Eagles secondary with a hundo and a touchdown, and the the worries go away. Much like with Mike Evans last week, I think your buy right game. your buy low window is about to slam shut. Todd Gurley in the panic room. Todd Gurley is the RB twenty five on the season. You can hit that button. Say, <laughs> I'm gra I'm grabbing me a seventy five inch television. Oh, I am, you're looting? I am looting the streets. I'm uh, grabbing guitars. I'm grabbing everything that doesn't belong to me because I am freaked out, man. I'm freaking out. Six red zone rush attempts through three weeks. 18 red zone attempts in 2018, including 10 uh, red zone rushing attempts in week two against the Cardinals alone. So this year, Jason brought it up earlier this week when we were kind of reflecting in the weekly rewind on Todd Gurley. He has four catches for eight yards in three games. That That's why I'm freaking out. 100%. Brad Evans says he's basically a better version of Sonny Michelle right now. Two years ago, 87 targets, 64 receptions. Last year, 81 targets, 59 receptions. This is a 60 reception player. That's who Todd Gur That's how he destroyed NFL yes. teams. His pace through three games is 32 targets, 21 receptions. That would be what Marlon Mack does that we're like, well, this guy doesn't catch the ball. I don't expect it to stay this bad as far as the passing work. I think that I, I've been talking to some of my Rams fan friends, you know, that the, they're diehard. They watch every game. And that's the one thing I keep bringing up is like, where is the screen game for the Rams in general? They dominate that, you know, with, with, with the screen. They have the just, past two years. Yeah. And they're just not even running the play. I can't imagine that just for some reason continues and they're like, yeah, we took that out. We don't we don't like what we were doing when we were killing teams with a screen game. But it's super concerning. And the the day of Todd Gurley being a, 
a beast for fantasy. That's just kaput. It's not like the injury concerns are gone. Right. Yeah, they're, and those still exist. They're not any different than they were before the season when, you know, the the concerns and the risk and the worry. Now they're three and oh. They're three and oh with this offense. They have, you know, Cooper Cup, another year in the league. You know, the screen game you know, I don't know how that changed with Cooper Cup in and out of the lineup and the dependency on it, but there's a lot of risk here. I'm a four. Mike, it's, you're a four. I'm absolutely a four. The Rams running backs have the lowest market share of of attempts of any team in the NFL. And Todd Gurley, that's the Jason, that's where he was killing people. It makes no sense. We're only three games in, so smaller sample. However, three games in and Todd Gurley's sitting here with eight receiving yards. Like that's that you gotta panic. You knew that you knew that the touchdowns and, and attempts were gonna go down, but the receiving work is a is a shock. All right, George Kittle. People want to talk about George Kittle because you haven't had that that big game yet. Tight end thirteen on the year. Obviously drafted to be a top three guy at the position. I'm a one. I'm a one with you, Andy. Mike I'm, Mike has a two. I'm a two. Right now, he um, he's third in yards after the catch. He was number one in that in 2018, so he's still doing that. Tied for second among tight ends with five red zone targets. So he had a couple of touchdowns called back, ones he actually caught, unlike the kind of TJ Hawkinson ones you drop right. uh, category. 25% uh, target share in 2018. or I'm uh, sorry, 26% last year, 25% this year. If you had two of his touchdowns that were called back on you know holdings that didn't really affect the play – Nobody's worried in the slightest about Kittle. He had 10 targets week one, eight targets last week. He is a really great option at tight end. He's the clear target leader for the team, even though some of these other wide receivers are stepping up. George Kittle's the number one for that team. I'm not worried in the slightest. The one concern I have, and it has to do with the success of the defense, yeah. Last year, this was a team that passed the ball 57% of the time. This year, they're 43%. That is the second largest change in the league outside of Minnesota. They have the highest run-to-pass ratio in neutral game scripts of any team in the NFL. Like the, their, their path to glory is running the ball. And so last year, they were a terrible defense and had backup quarterbacks in. So when I look at that number about, okay, his target share in the offense is the same, it's not. I mean, it, total targets and stuff like that changed because if you have the same percentage of targets but the targets total go down, that is the only concern that I have. But we also knew going into the season that, look, you're not going to break the NFL's receiving yardage record on every play, and he does have the ability to do what Ingram did last week, uh, you know, to break an 86-yard touchdown run, and not many players can do that. His yards after the catch is, you know, Gronkian from days of old, so... I'm a one, Mike. You're a two. Uh, yeah, and I'm I'm a two. The same way you are with Devonta Adams is just what he was drafted to be. Can he still reach close to that that level? I mean, and last year I know it's it it, I, it even pains me a little bit to bring it up and point out though, George Kittle's dominance was not with Jimmy Garoppolo. Like, it's just there was a better connection with guys like Nick Mullins. It possible at this point. Kittle will still be a high-level tight end, but is he going to be a top three guy? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I go back to those touchdowns that were called back. It was it was still Jimmy Garoppolo yeah. this season that was throwing the ball to Kittle and getting in the end zone. They just, you know, got the call back. All right, let's get into the Thursday night preview. Thursday night breakdown. Stepping out of the panic room. <sighs> Feels good. <laughs> because you guys watched that movie long ago, right? Oh yeah, Jody, Jody, Foster. Jody Foster. Foster. Yeah. yeah. It got a lot of uh, it got a lot of publicity because it was like shot in one spot for the whole movie in, very, in, in like the two panic weeks room or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I, the budget had to be in low, <laughs> right? Good, well, I mean, Jody Foster was making bank. We don't know. That's true. That's true. It, did it make you want your own like um, your own panic room at your house? Are you a fearful man, Jason? I'd, Do you want to go hide in a secret, you know, closet? No, I, no. I, if I were to if I were to pay up on some sort of protective something, it would definitely be a tunnel system 
under oh, my nice. oh, I want to I want to own a house You're that's a, like like three a houses away from mine and have an underground tunnel oh. connecting them, so I can just get in and out. I'm, so I'm you gotta re- you gotta own all the property in between that house and the oh, other one. Oh no, no, I just go deep. Oh really? You yep. can just ton- they won't know. It's a, um, I don't know the legality, but they won't know that I've built a tunnel. Just system stay out on rainy days under their house. Yeah. yeah. Get it. Okay. That is a that is a good point. How will they know? Yeah, they won't. They'll know when the when the gas line breaks and the whole <laughs> neighborhood explodes. Deeper, go deeper. <laughs> the answer to all these problems is just go deeper. Just not. Not too deep to the core. <laughs> the core of the earth is your concern? That's the big that's the number there one. There is some with room between the gas lines and the core of the of yeah, the earth. That's where I live. That's <laughs> that's me and the mole people. Thursday good, night good preview. To know. Thursday night, the Eagles at one and two. Take on the Packers in Green Bay. Packers, Hooray! Packers are four and a half point favorites. I'm just so happy to talk about this, unlike last Thursday. This will be a fun game. This yes. should be awesome. I mean, you got Carson Wentz against Aaron Rodgers. This this is going to be good. And Carson Wentz should have Alshon Jeffrey back. I think that makes a big difference. When he's missing Alshon Jeffrey and Deshaun Jackson, you could tell the struggles that the Eagles were having on offense. Now, this isn't quite panic room, but maybe he belongs there. 23rd. In the NFL, Aaron Rodgers is 23rd in air yards. That is between uh, the now injured Cameron Newton and Eli Manning. The now benched Eli Manning? Yeah, and that's also boosted by that Hail Mary uh, to Jimmy Graham in week one. So is this a different Aaron Rodgers? What's yes. your pa- Apply the same panic level scale to Aaron Rodgers. Oh, my panic level with Aaron Rodgers, yeah, I'd put it at a three. I think he's a three for me too because it's one of the hardest things in fantasy football for any owner that's played in fantasy for five or six years and knows what Aaron Rodgers used to be to change that mindset, to be willing to, you know, I know Al Borland has Aaron Rodgers in our league of record. I don't, and he's a Packer fan. I don't know if he'll ever like rotate to another no. quarterback. I know he's, he's shaking him. his head. No, regardless of, yeah, of the outcome. In his heart, he wants to. And, and he has the QB six on the year. And Footland, we recommend that, you don't. Sorry, do on the week. On the week. What I was like, Rodgers is not the six. Okay. Yeah, we. I like Rodgers this week against yes. the Eagles. So he's the QB six. Uh, by our rankings, consensus rankings this week, Eagles defense giving up the third most passing yards per game in 2018. You know they give up the fifth most. Uh, I'm sorry, that was yeah last year, and then this year they're fifth fifth worst. So they're not able to stop the passing game, and this should bode well at home for Aaron Rodgers. I agree. I that's why I said that this is the bounce back game for me for for Devontae Adams. The the I'm probably okay starting MVS if we're looking at the wide receiver position as well. He had the ten targets. I'm not expecting that. I if if there's a flipperoo between Devontae Adams ten or uh, Marquez ten and Devontae's four, that won't shock me at all. But but this Eagles secondary is beatable. I, I loved Kenny Galladay last week. It didn't work out because it turned into Marvin Jones. Someone for the Packers team is going to succeed, and I truly believe it will be Adams. At the running back position, Miles Sanders, Jordan Howard on the Philly side, Aaron Jones, Jamal Williams on the Green Bay side. Last week, Jamal Williams actually outsnapped Aaron Jones. Because of course. Well, yeah, because of course. We have Aaron Jones as the RB15 on the week. He's actually not been very efficient, effective. Some of the things we've seen from Aaron Jones in years past, he's 31st out of 32 qualified running backs in yards after contact. That's a problem. Uh, 40 routes run, just 44 receiving yards. 3.8 per carry. He was that guy in the Jamal Charles category previously. Right. So that comes with a little bit probably more of a commitment to giving him the ball and a change in some of the way that this team is, you know, they've been ahead. They've been winning games. When you run the ball, a lot of times when you're ahead, you lose some of that efficiency because the defense knows what is coming. But what do you make of this week for Aaron Jones going up against this Philly defense? I I mean, it's nice to see he's got three touchdowns over the last two weeks, but you've got to be a little worried that he's becoming touchdown dependent. He only had one reception for one yard last week, only 10 carries. The Eagles' defense is so far through the first three weeks. They are the they've given up the fifth fewest points to the running back position. 
I love that he's at home in you know a, a game they're expected to win. Those things are positive for Aaron Jones. I don't make too much of the inefficiencies here. There's a couple players that have been, uh, you know, Sony, carry on, uh, Aaron Jones. They they have been inefficient, and, but I think it's a small sample size and specifics of which carries they're getting. When you're getting goal line carries, sure, you're you max out at a yard, and that's a you know that's a great run. And so, um, I you know, it's one of those things where you're starting Aaron Jones because you drafted him to start him. He's been the goal line guy. They're in a winnable matchup, but I don't expect a huge. I, I don't this think he's a, a top twelve guy. This it could week. be a bad game. I mean, if Philadelphia gets out a little bit ahead of this one, and you got the split snaps, you know, Philly's like you said, they've been really good against the run. But he's the only running back here that I want to start on either side of the ball. Hmm. Okay, I don't want to start Sanders. Jamal Williams. I don't want to start Miles Sanders or Jordan Howard. Are you willing to trust Miles Sanders over David Montgomery this week? Sanders? Yeah, David Montgomery yeah, I think so. had double-digit fantasy points this past week and takes on Minnesota at home. Oof. But that game's got a 38-point over-under. This game has a 45-and-a-half point over-under. Miles Sanders being used in the passing game. A little I, bit. He, I, had, he had two really big plays last week. I would rather great, play which is great. Sanders. You know, we've seen that a little bit from him. I think I lean the Sanders direction too, but both guys, if if you can find more consistent options and and wait and see a little bit, I mean, that's where I'm at with both players. So back to Aaron Jones real quick. The the concerning thing for me is you had you know, LaFleur come out. We wanted to cram it in his cram hole, but he didn't, and he talked about, well, I got to even these carries up because week two, Aaron Jones was sensational. He had the full workload. And that that was too good for Lafleur. Lafleur did not like what he saw. Well, the good news is he couldn't balance it because Jamal Williams got the ankle injury. Remember, right? So, and now Jamal Williams was back, and he he evened things up big for sure. Time. If Aaron Jones comes out this week and has a big game, is that do you feel like that's going to run your confidence up for Aaron Jones, or are you going to try and sell high? A, because this is looking like a this is an RBBC. Yeah, this isn't going to change. This is this is going to be one of those things where Aaron Jones can have big weeks, but it's going to be a split with Jamal Williams. LaFleur does not want a one-back system. He's said that. He's shown that. Um, so, yeah, if, if Aaron Jones has a monster week where people believe he's going to be a top-five back and I could sell him for that, I probably would. All right, we've talked all about Devontae Adams. Let's hit the wide receivers in this game. Alshon Jeffrey should be back out there, expected to play. He's a tough start in this it game. Is. I mean, Green Bay is absolutely dominating. Fantasy-wise, they're you know, stopping wide receivers, quarterbacks, and tight ends to the tune of you know, basically giving up nothing to any of those positions through the year. I mean, 19 fantasy points to the wide receiver position. He's third best in the league, and that that's across all the wideouts they're facing. So... You know, Alshon coming off the injury Thursday night on the road against the great defense, he's a bench for me. Yeah, I, I don't want to play him. If, if you're desperate, I'm okay making that move. Uh, like if you've been, you know, your your uh, your bench is like Will Fuller, like these these tertiary guys that you've just, you've had to you had to play last week because Alshon Jeffrey was out. I would pivot back to Alshon, but I I'm like Andy, I don't. What about MVS in this game? Would you play Marquez, Valdez, Scantling, or Alshon? I would, pl I would play Alshon. I'll be MVS on that one. Uh, I think I would be MVS. MVS looks like a good matchup play. You brought up the fact that the Eagles secondary is beatable. Last week you loved Kenny Galladay. Yep. It just ended up going to the other guy. This week you love Devontae Adams. I, I do too. I think this should be the big breakout. But it could very well go to the other guy, and the other guy is MVS. I think we've seen through three weeks – that Marquez Valdez Scantling is the wide receiver two that yes. you want. That if you got if you're going to start that that's the guy that he is that, tied for t target lead with Devontae Adams. And and I do think the Green Bay Packers to to look at the other side and Alshon. I think the Green Bay Packers defense looks great. They have really shown that they are not the defense that is terrible of of the last few years. But we also need to be realistic. They've played against Mitchell Trubisky and Joe Flacco for two-thirds of the beginning of the year. So we can't swing the pendulum too far and just say that 
you know, Carson Wentz can't beat this defense either. I don't think Alshon is a must sit. I, I think if you've got him and you need to play him, you, you could still be okay there. All right, Nelson Aguilar, any interest with Alshon coming back at all in this matchup? It, uh, Djax is not expected to play, so I, I'm still okay with the flex play of Aguilar. I'm not excited, but I'm with you. Jimmy Graham, if your league no. gives bonus points for starting a corpse. Oh, come that's, on. That, that wasn't from me. That yeah. was from Kyle. Kyle, that was, that's so mean. It was mean, but, man, I liked it. <laughs> so I guess I'm mean. Zach Ertz, you're going to play Zach Ertz. Yeah. And uh, right now, don't need to talk about Dallas Goddard. He had one target that he dropped last week. So It would have been a good one, though. It was <laughs> right in the end zone. It would have been a touchdown. A reminder. I mean, that was a that was a drop, 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 ski. Wide drop open. Drop a Wide open. Yeah. I, I believe you said, Andy, when you watched that play, it looked like Mike catching the ball. <laughs> yeah, I liked how, what, yesterday was it on the show, Mike, where you, you made fun of me for hurting myself yeah. in some weird fashion. And you made fun of Jason, and Jason said he hurt himself r reaching for a shirt. I it did pop into my mind yesterday. You should have brought it up that you know my noodle arm threw you a like an out route, and it about blew your thumb up when no, we were was, in flag no, football. It it was a fly. It was it was a nine route, it, and uh, I tried to catch it over my shoulder, and I it was not good, and I broke my thumb. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nine route that I think was like at the point of reception, if we can call it that, was like 13 yards away. <laughs> well, I, I just, I, it reminded me of Dallas Goddard because both of you threw your hands up as though you were trying to like attack the football. There yeah. wasn't any soft hands. You this was not mighty ducks, you know, <laughs> soft ah, hands. Take that football. This was like, I'm going to punch you with my thumb and you paid the price. Look, look the football, he scored a point on that one. <laughs> he got me. <laughs> All right. Reminder, take your Thursday night players out of the flex, put them in a position on your regular roster so you have flexibility to deal with injuries, to deal with uh, change in circumstance. One of the reasons we tell you to do that is if you have a dud or a great game, it might change what you play in the flex position. So uh, just remember to do that. That's our little Wednesday reminder. And we want to thank today's studio sponsor, Everyday's studio sponsor, Pristine Auction. We want to thank them for supporting the show. A Michael Thomas signed jersey yesterday sold for $63. Signed. Beckett COA. PristineAuction.com. Use the code BALLERS. That is it for today's episode of the podcast. We'll be back with you tomorrow. We'll hit the week four matchups Thursday, Friday. We'll get starts of the week. Boom, boom, kicker, and a whole lot more. See you next time. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Remember that support for today's show comes from the oh-so-delicious Pepsi taking oh. NFL celebrations to the next level with the, the Hail Mary touchdown. The defense, like, your team gets a safety. Your team scores three fantastic touchdowns like Mike Evans style. you got to yeah, celebrate just, with a Pepsi. It's the crisp, cold deliciousness. Get, I mean, get the I've been a Pepsi guy my whole life. Get the imitators out of my face. Get me that Pepsi. Mm. Pepsi, the official sponsor of the NFL, reminding you, always be celebrating.